Hi everyone, welcome back. In this video, we're testing a new horn design, horn number 1931. And so this video is going to be a design review and then also the uh, test results with my subjective listening impressions on this new design. Okay, so this is uh, using the GRS PT6825 planar transducer. Um, so about five years ago, I started horn loading planar drivers starting with the BG Neo 8, uh, which is no longer available commercially uh, unless you can find them on the used market. GRS uh, has been producing these for relatively affordable cost, and so this is uh, kind of the third iteration. So it went from uh, horn loading on the Summer Rain horn, which had a 200 hertz cutoff. We then horn loaded it on a new design, the Sabrin 1309, which had a 300 hertz cutoff. And so this version is kind of a uh, focused, sound quality focused design, smaller format with a 500 hertz cross, 500 hertz cutoff, and uh, trying to see what can be done uh, with the very smooth horn flare geometry uh, using the ES horn flare curvature and uh, some other features that we'll get into. Okay, so um, the size format uh, fits nicely with small to medium size listening rooms and you can see here uh, this is with an 8 inch base cabinet. The horn itself measures uh, 13 inches wide by almost 18 inches tall. So you can see it there with my hand just kind of for scale. So for the prototype pair we printed them in this midnight blue color which almost has like a nice reflective sheen to it. Um, so with the design, we I started uh, with a new type of throat, which uses phase plugs uh, in between the, the gaps formed by the perforations in the driver itself. And you can see there, uh, there's this kind of the smaller phase plugs and then slightly larger. And then the big ones are spanning the larger gap what you see here, uh, there's actually a rib on the driver itself, which we have to make clearance for, and, and then the large phase plug. So the purpose of the phase plugs is to prevent any kind of cancellation uh, happening in the upper treble and to provide just that little bit more loading uh, in the upper treble to help lower distortion and provide a, a flatter frequency response. So section view, you can see the ES curvature there. I'll mention too, so this, this is available as a 3D CAD file for DIY. Uh, I'll put a link to the product page on my site. Now it can be printed as one piece, but I had to print it in two pieces there. You can see the split line. So that model is included as well with the split line. It also includes, you can't see it in the photo, but it does lo uh, include locating features uh, to help with glue up. Of the, of the various uh, 3D printed parts. Also included is the, uh, the 3D CAD model of the rear cover. And so this is a continuation again from the Sabrin horn where we do kind of a vented rear chamber. So it would typically be filled with polyfill. And then if you'd like, you could put like fabric on the interior uh, just to contain the, the polyfill. So that provides kind of the optimal amount of dampening off the rear for the rear wave. Um, so yeah, just we discussed the uh, phase plug uh, in the throat. So we're just going to get right into the measurement side. So you can see here, this is the impedance sweep for the planar driver on horn 1931. You can see the FS is at around 300 hertz. And then we do see a blip there at one kilohertz, which we'll see more of that in the next uh, few measurements. So you see the vertical scale is actually 10 ohm. So normally that's around 25 or 50 ohm. So this is exaggerating the results. The response uh, impedance sweep is very, very flat with no inductive rise whatsoever. Um, I mean, there's a little bit, but it's negligible. So looking at the frequency response, you can see here we actually get uh, output down to 300 hertz with a blip there. This is probably due to 
the FS of the driver being at 300 hertz, and it's also probably uh, a first order reflection, which is pretty common uh, with horns. Now, the usable bandwidth would be from 500 hertz up to 20 kilohertz. We do see a bit of a bump there, 3 dB bump at the 1 kilohertz, but otherwise we're about plus or minus 3 dB uh, across its bandwidth, which is a pretty good result. Uh, looking at the off axis, uh, we can see consistency with the 15, 30, and 45 degree off axis. And so as a colored polar map, you can see a gradual narrowing of the directivity. We do see a couple of anomalies here at the uh, 7 and 8 and 10 kilohertz, but the overall coverage is quite wide. So 120 degree listening window, and then it narrows to about a 60 degree listening window at 15 kilohertz. Uh, looking at the burst decay, it's um, we do see a little bit of stored energy there um, in the upper treble, but it doesn't exceed the 12 periods. Um, CSD plot, we do see some stored energy at the 1 kilohertz, but it is quite low into the noise floor. Uh, again, we're seeing some uh, stored energy, but the overall picture is that there's a very fast decay uh, that we're seeing. So distortion, I tested it at 85 and 95 dB. Uh, generally across the spectrum, we're at around 0.1% for the 85 dB test signal, which is 60 dB of dynamic range. Uh, just pointing out that it is very low at the 800 Hertz region. Increasing the test SPL, we see the uh, second harmonic predominantly the fundamental or the tone that's rising uh, with the higher order harmonics being quite low. So we do see a bit of a bump there at the one kilohertz as well. That might be just uh, an anomaly, but we'll just keep an eye on that moving forward. So intermodulation distortion, uh, we tested it at 85 and 95, and I also tested it with um, test tones. So we, we can see here the test tones range from 500 hertz up to 20K. If I scroll down here, I also did the same test with the test tones uh, ranging from 1 kilohertz up to 20 kilohertz. And I'll show you the result uh, on that in a bit. But what we are seeing is a slight rise in IMD through that trouble spot of 1 kilohertz. Um, but overall, we're about minus 65 dB through the mid range. And then we do see a slight rise uh, in the upper treble where IMD is minus 60 dB. So we basically see the same uh, with the increase in the test SPL. Uh, IMD is minus 50 dB for the upper treble. So we're seeing a linear rise in IMD as we raise the test SPL. Okay, so the next thing I did was change the test tones. So now we're not producing those 500 uh, up to one kilohertz test tones. And so what we see here is a drastic reduction in distortion for the mid range. So we're actually minus 80 dB uh, dynamic range through there. And then uh, we see uh, no change in the upper treble. Uh, so what that's telling me basically is that the IMD products that we're seeing in the upper treble are more related to spurious noises and reflections other and it's not modulating artifacts from the lower frequencies. Uh, so there's nothing really that we can do there. But if we wanted to increase the output uh, of this as far as the maximum output capability, then you can cross this higher at the one kilohertz instead of 500, kil 500 hertz uh, to allow maximum output. But we're still limited uh, in output with the upper treble. So I hope I'm not getting too complicated there, but generally um, we do see a an improvement in the mid range uh, when crossing a bit higher. Uh, so with the Gedley distortion, so this is something that I've just recently started measuring. And so I have limited comparison data, but what I do have is the RCF ND950 and also the 18 sound ND 1460 compression driver. So these are large format compression drivers and we're just comparing uh, test data against the 1931 horn. And so with the night, with the, uh, with the 1931 horn at the 95 dB test signal, the GM is 0 0.0031. Uh, that would be the red line here. And so we're looking at the eight kilohertz region 
0.0031. So what I found, what I the test results that I got with the, the RCF 950, ND950 was 0 0.007, okay? So basically the distortion is 50% that of the RCF compression driver. And then the 18 sound was at 0 0.0118, so significantly higher GM distortion uh, than this 1931 horn. And so just to go back a bit, so this, this is just an overlay of the 85 and 95 dB test signals uh, for the 1931 horn. And so you can see the blue is the 85 dB. So it actually is very low uh, distortion in the upper treble, uh, 0.0014. So we'll see how that fares as we continue to do this test with other drivers to see if this actually uh, is, a, is a good number or not, but it does seem to be a pretty good number. So subjective listening impressions. So I found that the upper treble was quite smooth, had excellent sound stage depth, great output capability. Uh, I found that it was more dynamic than an average bookshelf speaker, but it wasn't quite as dynamic sounding as a uh, compression driver. But I will note that it sounded smoother than most compression drivers. Uh, great coherency through the vocal range, and I did find that it needed some minor EQ at that one kilohertz area, uh, either through DSP, adding a little notch filter, or doing that in the passive crossover. So otherwise, the uh, sound came out as a little bit forward sounding. Personally, I'm very sensitive to that part of the frequency range. And so just something to note there uh, in that in this design. So other another uh, tribute is I didn't detect any kind of horn coloration uh, with this particular horn. And I believe that's likely due to having the full uh, ES horn flare curvature. So there you have it, a uh, full set of test data on horn 1931 using the GRS PT6825 planar transducer. Um, so I'll put some information in the description there. So that's it for today. Take care and have a great day. And you can see my cat. He's just sleeping away. <laughs> All big stretch. Mm -hmm. Epic slumber. See ya.